My name is Mark Friday. Uh, 19 years ago, I was candidating at this church in July, and the church asked me to be their senior pastor, and I came and uh, had a wonderful 11 years. Uh, felt that the Lord was uh, moving to have First Baptist have a new leader. I do pretty well in the things that I'm really good at, that I'm probably not the greatest leader, and so God has uh, blessed here, and we are so thrilled to have Vernon around. When my uh, family came, they were uh, high school down to eight years old, and uh, let me show you a picture of them now. So Catherine, the uh, 26-year-old, is up in Madison uh, and on the left-hand side, and she is a child life specialist in the emergency room at the Children's Hospital. Jonathan, the oldest, 34, is a uh, Imagineer with Disney trying to figure out what the next uh, rides and attractions will be around the world at the Disney parks. And then Jenny and I, Jenny was here first service. She works part-time at the Christian school, and she's paying the bills now, actually. It's kind of, they moved her over a little bit. Uh, David uh, spent eight years in the military at the Air Force and now has left to become a chemistry nerd, and he's getting his Ph.D. at the University of Illinois right now and, uh, in physical chemistry and uh, is thrilled to be there. And last but not least, my horse girl, this is Laura. She has uh, two degrees in horse therapy and in social work, so she uses horses down in the rural Lexington area to help people, uh, whether it's uh, PTSD uh, guys and gals from the military or children who are struggling and stuff. They literally use horses to help uh, people, and she runs the place. Uh, when I left here, I spent three years as a Bible teacher at Peoria Christian, was going to Cross Point Church over in East Peoria, and by God's hand, it was a weird situation. I was going to leave to become a pastor again, and the senior pastor said, well, so you're going to go and be a, a senior pastor? I said, no. In my older age, I, I'm really good at administration, and I love people, and I kind of want to find a church that needs a lover of people and a good administrator, and his jaw hit the floor. He said, you don't know this, but that's who we're looking for in the near future. So they hired me. I've been there uh, five years on staff. Um, I'm 63, and my boss is 37. And... <laughs> The youth pastor's 23 and the worship, pa excuse me, the worship pastor's 23 and the youth pastor's 30. So I am the old guy on staff, but it sure helps when you can't figure out that computer, I'll tell you that. So, well, when Pastor Vernon asked me to preach, I immediately thought of a couple things that I'm just very passionate about. Uh, one of them is the unity of the Church of Jesus Christ, but I realized I preached a sermon on that when I candidated here 19 years ago, and I thought, well, somebody's going to remember that, and well, I just use those over again. I said, no. The other one that I'm really passionate about is helping people see who they are in this relationship with God and how God wants them to be used by him on this earth. And so what we're going to talk about today is stewarding God's stuff well. That we are stewards of God. And it's not a word we use very often. And in fact, you may not even have that word in your Bible very often. But it is a concept that is all over the place. And I want to talk about big picture what is a steward in God's kingdom, and then flesh out just one area of stewardship, uh, of our financial stewardship. If, if I was really doing this, I'd have to ask Pastor Vernon for a three-week sermon series because it would take that long to cover the other areas of God's work in our lives, of our time and our talents and things like that. But before we're done, we'll talk about uh, how God wants us to steward his money so let me tell you a story about, I'm going to call him Tony, one of my best buddies back in St. Cloud before I came here. I was there for 14 years, youth pastor, associate pastor, and Tony and I were in a guys group, 
and we would get together. We weren't doing a Bible study. We were just doing kind of get together and how's, how's life in the kingdom of God and your responsibilities going. And we talk about our, how are you doing as a husband, how are you doing as a father, blah, 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 all these different things. Well, one day we just decided we're going to talk about money and how are we doing in that area. And we're, we're four of us in the group, and it's usually all four of us talking, but that day, Tony didn't say much. And I noticed. And I'm like, well, I'm not going to say anything right now, but afterwards I just said, hey, Tony, I, I just noticed you didn't have much to say today. Yeah. <sighs> you know, Pastor Mark, I got three kids, and I'm worried about you know, college someday, and that's really expensive, and, and, and I've got a lot of bills to pay, and, and I know that I've been blessed by God with a good job and all, but, you know, I, I really struggle with this whole, you know, thing of giving much to church and all that. He said, but my problem is I got a wife who's praying for me. And you know what happens when you have a praying wife. She was praying that Billy would open up his heart to what God wanted him to be doing with their money. Because she saw it one way, probably more the way I saw it, and Tony did not see it that way. I'll tell you Tony's story ending at the end of the service. So what is a steward? Big picture, we want to talk about what does this mean that we're going to be a steward? Well, first of all, it's defined as someone who's entrusted with something. It could be anything. You've been entrusted by someone with something, and now you are a steward of that. In the Bible, it might be a household manager. And the very first person, by the way, this is a topical sermon, so if you have your Bible, you're going to be going around, but all the, all the verses are going to be on the screen, so it'd probably be easier to just watch up there. But the very primo example of what a steward is in the Bible is a man named Joseph. And some of you know his story. He was sold by his brothers into slavery in Egypt, and he got bought by a rich guy named Potiphar. And Potiphar owned, you know, hundreds of acres, thousands of acres. He had, he had cattle, he had sheep, he had people, he had slaves, all these things. And Joseph rose up in his servant squad <laughs> to number one. And Potiphar was the owner of it all, but Joseph became Potiphar's steward to take care of it all for him. Well, some of you know the story. Potiphar's wife was an evil woman, and he ended up in jail by being falsely accused. In jail, God has his plan going, and he gets him in front of Pharaoh. And I love this title, Joseph works his way up to being the vice pharaoh of Egypt. He is the number two man in Egypt. And here's what Pharaoh says to Joseph in Genesis chapter 41. I hereby put you in charge of the whole land of Egypt. And then verse 44, Pharaoh said to Joseph, I am Pharaoh, but without your word, no one will lift hand or foot in all of Egypt. It belonged to Pharaoh. He was the owner, but Joseph was his steward, his head steward, and he was the one who controlled it all. Today you might think of like a rich person who has a mansion, and he has a head butler. And that butler's taking care of the kids, taking care of the gardeners, taking care of the servants and the cooks and everything. He's the head guy over it all, but he doesn't own it. He just is the manager of it. Or maybe a business owner. A couple owns a business and they get tired of running the day-to-day, -day, so they hire someone to be the CEO or the president. And that president doesn't own the business, but the president is responsible for making the business run and he's responsible to the owners. So I think that's how God sees you and I. He is the owner of it all, and we are his stewards. We're the ones that have been entrusted by him with stuff, money, things, time, talents, abilities, and stuff, and he expects us 
to steward that well. So what, is, what are the traits of a steward? What, what, what would that look like? Well, number one, they've been, been given authority and responsibility over things that aren't theirs. It's not mine, it's God's, and he's given me authority over it to manage it well and accountability that I'm gonna be responsible to him for how I did it while I was here on this earth. Number two, we're accountable to the master concerning how I've handled those things. So we have God as the owner. He's the person that's got it all and we're his stewards that are managing it well. So what would the attitudes that God or any master would want to see in his good stewards? Because it's one thing to say, what, what are you going to do? But it's more important that we get an idea of what would our attitude towards God be. Number one, you would say to God, God, all I have is from you. None of it is really mine. The time that you give me, whether it's short or long, the money that you give me, whether it's a lot or a little, the talents that you give me, whether they're obvious or behind this, it doesn't matter. It's all yours, and I'm just a steward or a manager of your stuff. 1 Chronicles 29, yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor. For everything in heaven and on earth is yours. Jump over to the New Testament, James chapter 1, verse 16. Don't be deceived, my brothers. Every good and perfect gift is come from above, <clears throat> coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights. Every good and perfect gift that we have in this life comes from our Father in heaven, and we are stewards of those gifts on his behalf. Attitude number two, when I give my time, my talents, my money, I'm really just being a good steward or a manager of your stuff. When, when I take what you've given me and reinvest it in the kingdom, whether it is giving of your talents or your time or, or your finances, that God has given you, you're, you're reinvesting what God has given you and I'm just being a good manager of your stuff. Attitude number three. My, vote, my motivation for giving is because you've given so much to me, Lord. You've asked me to give back to you. I, I'm going to be obedient. I love you. And I want to see you glorified. I used to do a sermon series in the book of Ephesians, I think it was the only sermon series I did twice at this church in the 11 years. And I kept saying the same thing over again until people got sick of it. It ain't all about you, Bubba, or Bubette. It ain't all about you. It's about him. And we're trying to live a life that glorifies him in everything that we do, including how we manage his stuff. And attitude number four, because you're so gracious, I am typically blessed because I give. 2 Corinthians 9, Paul says, remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. The uh, prophet Clayton Horton was sitting right over there in the first service. Clayton told me this one time. He said, you know, when you give and invest in the kingdom of God the way he wants, it's amazing how long your refrigerator will last. This, is, this isn't a, a, an agreement between you and God where, oh, God, I'll give you $100, so you give me $200 back, right? You know, that's not how it works. But that when we're faithful, God is faithful to us as well in, in a, a variety of ways. So it's really not, it's my time, it's my money, it's my talents, it's God's time and money and talents that he's given me and I am a good steward, manager, I'm accountable, I'm responsible for all of it. To do with it what he would want me to do. So that's what it looks like in the big picture. That's what a steward is. 
And so we're going to spend the rest of the time talking about one practical application. Like I said, we'd have to have two or three sermons here to get them all in. But what does it look like on a practical level to be a good steward of God's money that he has given to us? What does that look like to be a good steward of God's money? And I'm Thanking the Lord, as Pastor Brad said, you've, you've been generous to the church and they're doing well. Pastor Vernon said, you know, I'm really, I'm glad you're preaching on this, but you know, in these days we're doing well and I'm not, I'm not here to get more money into the church. I'm here to help us see no matter what church we go to and no matter what we're doing, that we would be good stewards of God's money and what that looks like. So why talk about money? Well, first of all, Jesus talks about it a lot. I don't know if you've ever heard, but he talks more about money than he talks about heaven and hell. And that is true in the New Testament. Jesus is very concerned about financial things. And I think, I'm not positive, it doesn't say it in black and white, but I think there's something about money that shows where your heart is. It's an issue of the heart. And I remember going downstairs this morning because I have a barometer down there. I'm always wondering, how's my basement's humidity doing? And I went down this morning and I'm looking, oh, it's down to 48%. That's good. I can turn the dehumidifier off for a while. Well, I think just like that dehumidifier is, is controlling the, the humidity in a, that our hearts show through how we manage the money God has given us where our hearts are in those days. I had a seminary professor, his name is Professor Hendricks. He used to do Bible studies in Dallas with very rich businessmen. That was his group of guys that he met with. And he said, you know, I'd, we'd do Bible studies together and some guy would just, the, the lights went on and oh my gosh, I'm a sinner and I need a Savior, and he calls out to Jesus, and we're so excited that he's been saved, and he's following the Lord and all that, and and he said, we were really excited. But he said, we knew we really had him, or the Lord really had him, when we saw his pocketbook change, what he spent and invested his money in changed because of his relationship with, with Jesus. That's when I knew that the Lord really had him. Jesus puts it this way in Matthew 6, 24. No one can serve two masters. Either he'll hate the one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. It just doesn't work. You have to choose which is the boss. So what are the principles concerning how we handle God's money that are clear in the Scriptures? Well, first of all, we're going to remember that it's all His. Some people have this mindset, and I've heard it many times, that if I'm giving to the church the part that I think God wants me to give, that all the rest is mine to do whatever I want with. It's like, ah! No, no. No, God wants you to to use all of it the way he would want you to use it. And part of it is investing back in the kingdom, in your local church and other ministries. But even if you do that faithfully, he still wants you to manage the rest of the money the way he wants you to manage it. We can't think it's, well, this is my part. It's all God's part. I mean, just imagine Joseph. You know, thinking, well, part of this is mine, and it's like, no, it's, it's Potiphar's, or no, it's Pharaoh's. No, it's all God's. And part of it we reinvest in the kingdom, and the other part that we don't, we still want to handle God's way. So principle number one, we're going to give to God first. We're going to give to God first. There is a concept in the Bible that's all over the Old Testament, 14 times in the law, 23 times in total, and six times mentioned in the New Testament called first fruits. And here's how that goes. I'm a farmer in the Old Testament. I have 100 acres. I'm going to harvest my 100 acres of wheat, and the first 10 acres that I harvest 
are going to the Lord, going to the priests. Not the last 10 acres that I harvest, the first 10 acres. And even in priority, if I'm a farmer and I have 10 sheep, I don't look at the 10 sheep and go, yeah, which is the scrawniest one that I'll give to the Lord? I look at the 10 sheep and say, which is the best one that I would give to the Lord? And I'll keep the other nine. So it's an issue of first fruits. And often, when we do that, there's blessing. So listen to Proverbs chapter 3, verse 9. It says, Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of your crops. And then it goes on in verse 10 again. Then, typically, your barns will be filled to overflowing, and your vats will brim over with new wine. That's when your refrigerator lasts a long time and God blesses you in many ways. Billy said to me when, excuse me, Tony said to me when we were talking, you know, Mark, um, what I'd really like to do is I'd like to wait to the end of the month and see how much money I have left and then I'll decide how much I can give to God. And because I knew him well and we were good buddies, I just looked at him and I said, oh, and I bet God feels really special then. Not. God says, no, I want you to decide with me what you're going to invest in my kingdom and I want you to choose to do that first and then you let the rest of the month happen and you just watch me how we can make that work. So number one, we're going to give to God first. Number two, we're going to give to God regularly. Now this is not some legalistic thing that you're supposed to have an offering every time you walk in the church. How you deal with that is your business. I had good friends in Dallas when I was at seminary. He was a contractor. And Chris would get nothing for months as far as income, and then uh, a contract is done and he's finished and boom, he's got $80,000. So that day, he'd write out a check for how much he thought God wanted him to give to the church. And so he didn't do it every week, he didn't do it every month, but he gave on a regular basis whenever he got income. It's a concept that's all over the Old Testament, but I thought Paul's words in 1 Corinthians we're really encouraging. So Paul, we're going to talk about this twice in the sermon, Paul is worried about the believers in Jerusalem. There's bad stuff going on there, drought, they're they're really needy. And so he goes to the churches around in Asia and Europe and he asks them to give a special offering to him so he can take it to to the people that need it in Jerusalem. So this isn't your, their regular giving, but it's something that they know Paul is going to come and get at some point. So here's what he says. Now about the collection for God's people. Do what I told the Galatian churches to do. On the first day, first fruits, of every week, regular, each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with his income, saving it up, so that when I come, no collection will have to be made. I don't want you to be, oh my gosh, Paul's here. i, I got to run and see how much. No, I want you to decide ahead of time with the Lord how much are you going to give to this. And every week, put it aside. Because in those days, they didn't have cell phones. Like, yeah, I'm on my way. I mean, he's just going to show up at some point and get the offering. And he wants them to be ready to have given this every week, sum of money so that they're ready to give as they want to. But now the biggie, the one you've all been waiting for. How much do I got to give? How much do I got to give? Well, that was Tony's attitude. And as I said to him, well, we got a heart problem because you got the wrong question. It's not how much do I got to give, it's how much do I get to invest. And there's a big difference in a heart issue. Well, I remember in seminary, this Prof. Hendricks had a class and he was talking about giving and this type of sermon. He was giving a teaching and one of the, one of the guys raised his hand and he said, so Prof, 
do I got to give on the gross of my earnings or how about just the net? You know, after taxes, can I just give on that? And we're, and we're all sitting there, oh, I, wonder, I don't know. What does the Bible say about that? And he said, uh, your heart's in the wrong place. Uh, that's not a very good question. Just you and the Lord figure that out. My father-in-law would always say, well, it depends whether you want to be blessed on the net or the gross. I mean, that was your question. Paul says, 2 Corinthians 9, each man should give what he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, not because the, the pastor's twisting your arm, but because you want to out of your heart, for God loves a cheerful giver. So what does the Bible say, though? I mean, is there, is, there, is there any help here of like how much I would give? Well, in the Old Testament, many of you have heard of the word tithe. And a tithe literally means one-tenth. But I did find out, as I studied this many different times, that a lot of scholars would say, you know, we think of Old Testament being you give 10%. That's the beginning. That was the baseline. In some years, depending on how many extra gifts and festivals they had and stuff, people were giving much more than that. 20, 25, even 30% might be closer. But 10%, that word tithe, was kind of the minimum. That's how it got started. Now, how many of you here at church still sacrifice bulls and sheep? No? You don't do that here? Go oh, good. Whew. Yeah, we're not under the Old Testament law, are we? But every time I see Jesus in the New Testament taking an Old Testament principle and bringing it over to his kingdom, what does he do? Does he lower the bar? I don't see him lowering the bar. You've heard it said, you know, blah, 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 blah. But let me tell you, in my kingdom, and he raises the bar on a very regular basis. So how does that bar look in the New Testament, well, there's two principles that Jesus and his followers talk about. Number one, you're going to give proportionally. Give proportionally. Luke 12, from everyone who has been given much, much will be demanded. And from the one who has been entrusted with much, much more will be asked. If there are people in this room that have a little there's people that have a lot, and obviously, the people who have a lot, the Lord's expecting more from. That would be a concept. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 8, For if the willingness is there, in your heart you want to give, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what you don't have. You don't have to feel bad if you can't give thousands and thousands of dollars if God hasn't blessed you with a lot of money you would be comfortable saying, well, this is the portion that I think I should give and I don't have much, but that's okay because my heart is right in wanting to give. But the one that's much more difficult, the principle besides giving proportionally is one that Jenny and I are still working on. It's called giving sacrificially. And what does that really look like? What does that mean? So Jesus is at the temple. His disciples are around, and he's always looking for a time to teach and help them understand how this really works. And people are going to buy in the temple treasury, and they're throwing in big amounts of money. They think there was literally a horn, like a tuba, that people threw money in. So if you threw in a bunch of coins, you know, ring, and everybody, ooh, wow. And Jesus is standing around going, but then a little widow shows up. Verse 42 of Mark chapter 12. But a poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins in the treasury worth only a fraction of a penny. And calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, I tell you the truth. This poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others in God's accounting. Why? Why? Because they all, the guys who threw in all that money, they all gave out of their wealth. They went home with a bunch of money. They had money waiting at home. But she, 
gave out of her poverty. She put in everything, all that she had to live on. She didn't have anything when she got home. That's called sacrificial giving. It means something. It hurts. It changes something about the way you live because you are investing so sacrificially. But my favorite example, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, Paul is trying to encourage the Corinthian church on this special offering. He's trying to encourage them, you know, you, I want you to really give. And he thinks of the Macedonians. They're, they're way up north in Europe, and they were the poorest churches that Paul visited. So poor that if you read between the lines in the different letters of Paul, we're not sure he even asked them to help with this special offering. Like, they are so poor, they don't need to be given to this special offering. We're not even sure he asked them. But trying to get the Corinthians to really give, here's what he tells them. Now, brothers, we want you to know about the grace that God has given these poor Macedonian churches. Out of the most severe trial, they had overflowing joy and their extreme poverty. These people are so poor, and they're in a lot of trials, but they have overflowing joy in their lives. What did they do? That all welled up in rich generosity. For I'm telling you, I testify that they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability, these poor churches, entirely on their own, they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the saints down in Jerusalem. And they did not do as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and then to us in keeping with God's will. If I were to play that out, I think what Paul is saying is, they were so poor we didn't ask them, but they came to me and they pleaded with me, can we give to these poor saints in, in Jerusalem? And Paul's like, well, sure, if you want to. I'll probably get a hundred bucks. And when they gave, he started counting it and it was $5,000. More than he ever imagined they could give. And what was the secret to their overflowing generosity? The last verse. They gave themselves first to the Lord and then they gave to us. They had their heart right and the giving came from there. So I'm not going to say her name. We'll call her Linda. Connie remembers a story, my secretary, while I was here. Linda was a widow at First Baptist Church. She had nothing other than her Social Security check. Linda came to me more than once, struggling. I reminded her we have a food pantry. I mean, she's kind of proud, didn't want to, you know. And one time she asked me, she said, Pastor Mark, do you think if for a few months I didn't give my full tithe that I... That, that that'd be okay with God. And I'm like, you know, if you gave half your tithe for a few months, God knows your heart. Don't worry about it. She went away. I don't know what, I don't know what she did. All I know is that about three months later, Connie came to me in my office and said, Pastor Mark, you gotta come out here. And I went out. And here stands Linda at the front of your entryway, with two big bags of groceries. And I'm like, what? What are you doing? She said, Pastor Mark, I got a $50 check from the government. I didn't even know it was coming. I don't know why she got it. She, out of the blue, the $50 check. So I went and bought $25 worth of groceries for the food pantry. I said, Linda, you take those groceries home and put them in your pantry. You should have seen the look she gave me. Pastor Mark, God told me to give this, so it's going to the food pantry. I'm like, okay. <laughs> That's called sacrificial giving. 
Two final issues on the issue of money. People ask me, well, church or other Christian ministries, what's the balance there? The Bible doesn't talk about it because in the New Testament there weren't any. There weren't any youth for Christ. There weren't any teen challenges. I mean, there were no parachurch organizations really. I mean, we got Paul being a missionary, being supported by churches, but that's really about it. So I think most churches would say because the church of Jesus Christ is is the primary mode of, of sharing with the world Jesus that you would start with your local church and give to that first. And then, I mean, Jenny and I literally have a slush fund. We invest in other missionaries. We invest in some uh, groups and stuff. And then we have a slush fund. And we hear, oh, Teen Challenge needs this or Youth for Christ needs this. And we have money that we can give. But you would start with your local church. Second of all, what do I do if I'm not there yet? What if I do if, honestly, I'm, I'm Tony right now? I've been blessed by God, but I'm just really concerned about my bills, and I know I'm not given as God wants. I mean, what, what do I do with that? Well, first of all, remember, it's a heart issue. It's between you and the Lord. It's not between you and Pastor Vernon. It's between you and the Lord. You know, go back to the scriptures, look at the things we've talked about today, think through with God, you know, what would he want you to do? Study and pray, ask somebody that's more mature than you, you know, how would I do this? I'm Billy, and I had some good conversations about this. But then, do what God asks you to do. You know, I had a CE director when I was a youth pastor, she came to me one time kind of on the side and she said, hey, Pastor Mark, you know, I, I give 10% of the church every month, but God, I, I can honestly say I'm, I'm kind of not doing it with a cheerful heart. It's kind of more like, yeah, I should. And she said, do you think I should keep doing that? And I said, yeah, I think out of obedience, you, you know God wants you to give that. But now you can pray, you know, God, I, I want my heart to be where my hands are, so would you help me to be a cheerful giver in giving to whoever I give to? Well, let me tell you the end of the Tony story. So Tony started working with his wife, and they started figuring out what God wanted him to give, and he couldn't go from 1% to 10% or whatever it was. I don't know exactly what he gave in, in, in a month, but over time he started. And you know what happened? He got fired. <laughs> he got fired from his church, I mean from his job was not a good day. And we had long talks and all that. And he's like, you know, God, God's going to get us through this. It's okay. I've got some money in the bank if I don't have a job for two months, you know, whatever. He ended up buying his own little um, helping group because he was in the trucking business and this group helped truckers get their licensure and stuff like that. But just a little, he bought a little teeny business that was run by like a guy and his wife. That was it. And over time, he built the business up and built the business up, and he was giving to the church in a more gracious way and all of that. And 10 years later, he's asked to be an elder at the church. He serves as an elder for, I think, six, eight years. He becomes the head elder of the church. He's actually on sabbatical right now, kind of taking a break. Um, and his paychecks within five years are higher than it used to be at his old job that he got fired from. And I just talked to him the other day. We're going to go visit them probably in October. And all he can tell me every time I talk to him is, Pastor Mark, you have no idea how God has blessed us. And he's not just meaning financially, financially over and abundantly, but in so many other ways with their children, with he and his wife's ability to help their church and work through issues. They went through a very hard season at their church. And it's just like God has been so, so gracious. And I'm not saying all of that happened because Tony decided to get his heart right in giving to his church. But as he got his heart right about that, 
a lot of other things started heading in the right direction, including getting fired from his job, and he started trusting God. I don't have to wait to the end of the month. I can trust God by giving to him at the beginning of the month, and he'll figure it out with me. I know this can be a sensitive topic, I know that it's hard, but I'm thrilled that I heard from Pastor Vernon that in these days, you know, First Baptist is doing very well and they're giving and praise God for that. But honestly, I'm not, I'm not interested in what First Baptist's bottom line is. That's not what I'm interested in. Or Cross Point's bottom line. We're, we're struggling. We're like $12,000 in the hole right now. What I'm interested in is do you see yourself, do I see myself as a steward of everything that God has given me? Am I handling my time, my talents, my energy, my, my money that God has given Am I handling that in a way that honors him and that gives him glory? Because I am convinced that if a church runs out of money or if a church runs out of volunteers, which by the way, just a little commercial here, I was a Kids Hope volunteer over at the school. Henry, I got him when he was in kindergarten. Henry's going to be a junior right now at Pekin High School, and I still meet with him about once every two months to just do fun stuff. We went to a ball game in July. It's not part of the program anymore. We just got to know each other, and we're still doing life together. So if you want to know what to do, or teenagers... Spending time with teenagers. I have a guy at my church. He's 70, and he just signed up with the youth pastor to help out. But I'm convinced that if the church runs out of money or volunteers or people don't have time, the issue is not that everybody went on vacation or all the, all the houses are having struggles. The issue becomes a hard issue of the individuals. I just haven't put God in his place in my life that I see myself as a steward of his stuff and his money and his time and his talents that he's given me and I'm stewarding them well. And if you would say that that is true of you, just go home and talk to him about it. Make a plan, go home and talk to your spouse. What do we need to do different in the area of money, in the area of giving, in the area of, of volunteering, whatever it would be in the kingdom of God? Because I don't know about you, but I really hope that on that day that I get met by St. Peter at the pearly gates, that Jesus comes out and says to me, well done, my good and faithful steward. Let's pray. Father God, I am so grateful for how you have blessed us as individuals. We are the richest people on this planet. God, have you, how you have blessed the, the people in this church with talent and ability and time to be able to, to serve in many different ways. I'm so grateful to see people that I remember from 19 years ago who are still serving. And we are so grateful for what you have given us, and I pray that each person here would just have a chat with you today, maybe with their spouse as well if they're married, and, and just ask that question, how are we doing in our money, in our time, in our talent investment in the kingdom of God? Are, are we seeing it as his stuff, or is it mine, mine, mine? And Lord, if the answers aren't what you want them to be, I just pray that you'd Show us what they should be. And I thank you how you blessed First Baptist and pray that you would continue using them to reach the people of Pekin and the surrounding area with the gospel of Christ and that you would continue growing each one of them more and more into the man or woman you've asked them to be. And we ask all of this in Jesus' precious, precious name. Amen.